You're listening to Little Green Cheese, episode 80. Well, welcome back, Curd Nerds. I'm Gavin Weber, and this podcast is where you can learn about cheese making at home. Well, thanks for joining me again this week. Got some interesting uh, cheesy questions from lots of curd nerds out there, and we've got one little new story. In fact, it's a little bit about a cheese mite. And funnily enough, uh, a, uh, this is called the, well, let me pronounce it right, Wirchweiser Mite Cheese, it's called. So in a small town of Wirchweiser, Germany mites get locked into wooden boxes with a soft unaged white cheese known as quark. Now quark's a very simple cheese to make. In fact I don't have a video tutorial tutorial about it so um, I'll have to fix that. Anyway back to the story. As the mites feast they ripen the cheese but even after they've completed their work these microscopic arachnids aren't off the hook. Diners eat the cheese with the critters still covering the rind. Sounds like an interesting little cheese. Um, only a single company in this village makes milk ben K's or Wirchweiss ch- mite, mite cheese. While it's, centuries old, while it's a centuries-old practice, the art of making mill ben K's nearly disappeared until several townspeople made an effort to preserve it. Cheesemakers begin begin by seasoning balls or cylinders of dried quark with salt, caraway and elderflower. Then they let the mites feed on the pieces for about three months, regularly turning and aerating the cheese. Although the mites' activity creates an unpleasant uh, ammonia-like smell, they helpfully excrete enzymes that ripen the cheese into a nutty, slightly bitter finished product. A Wirchweiser's a cheese making operations is the only organisation sanctioned by the government to make Milben K's, which is a legal, a legally protected name and tightly regulated due to the presence of live mites. Locals have um, certainly embraced this claim to fame. They built a statue. They built a statue of a cheese mite in the town centre. Now that's getting behind. Uh, your local cheese, isn't it? <laughs> Especially when it's covered in little uh, arachnids uh, that are uh, secreting enzymes into your cheese. Sounds very interesting. In fact, it sounds very similar to a French cheese called Mimolette. Um, I do believe that they are balls of cheese which are heavily um, coloured by a natto and they are fed to cheese mites and they get these little pits in the uh, in the rind as well, and I think that uh, they may be some of those little uh, beasties in there when the people eat mimolette cheese as well. So very interesting. Uh, Wirsch Wise in Germany uh, makes that cheese. Wirsch Wise might cheese. Hopefully, I got the pronunciation right. Anyway, I got this story from um, Atlas Obscurica, um, which uh, has a whole bunch of. Uh, gastronomic delights and stories uh, and I'll put the link into the show notes now I've kind of got things back the front today um, I didn't tell you about things that I'm working on um, of course I'm still working on my book I managed to uh, bash out I think I'm up to 15,000 words um, at the moment so not sure how many pages that is uh, that's a lot um, so uh, lots of words. Um, I have still got to finish about 25 out of the 52 recipes. So what I'm going to, what I'm having to do, and this, I don't know why I didn't write them down in the first place. I'm pretty sure I did write them down, but I just can't find the book that I wrote them down in. So I got half the recipes in my um, handy dandy notepad. Um, but unfortunately, um, I can't find the rest of them. So what I'm having to do is go back through my videos 
about the cheeses and um, basically transcribe them onto paper and then type them um, into my uh, my document, which will become my my book. Keep calm and make more cheese. Um, so uh, yeah, a bit of uh, fun and games going on there, but uh, I'm slugging through it. So I'm doing about uh, two recipes a day, so that should get us uh, uh, finished by don't know lots. What's that? Two recipes a day, 25, 12 and a half days, but I don't do it every day. That's the thing. Anyway, uh, we'll see. It'll be out soon enough. Um, just uh, hold on and uh, you'll get a lovely cheese making book with some new recipes um, that you've seen um, since I wrote the first book back in 2012. So that's six years ago I wrote that book. That's amazing. And it still sells well today. That's uh, the first version, Keep Calm and Make Cheese. Um, on Thursday, I'm going to try and make a cheese. Um, and it uh, has Mexican origins. And it's called um, Oaxaca, which is uh, spelled O-A-X-A-C-A, Oaxaca. Um, I think that's how you pronounce it. And uh, it's a Mexican string cheese that is uh, very similar to oh, mozzarella in taste. Um, but it uh, uh, basically, you string it out as much as you can um, into thin strings and uh, basically roll it into a ball. It looks like a tennis ball um, size. Um and, and then you just cut it and you eat it, and it's string cheese that's been wrapped into a ball. So pretty cool. So I'm going to try and make that on Thursday, um, which is a day after the show's been released. Anyway, now we've got some listener questions, and one of them may be a little bit involved. Um, I've had to do some research because even though I've experienced this issue before, uh, I had I didn't know there was a solution to it. So anyway, we'll we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but uh, let's get on with the uh, the questions. Okay, the first voicemail this week is from Elaine, and uh, Elaine just wants to say hello. And um, well, here's Elaine. Hi. I'm Elaine Towler, uh, just joined your group, uh, assigned to your website, etc. Uh, just joined a cheese making at UK FP group and a complete novice apart from the fact that I have actually made mozzarella for my kit uh, and that's about it. So looking forward to looking at your videos and getting involved. Thanks. Looks like a great site. Bye. Oh, thanks, Elaine. Appreciate it. And welcome on board. Um, I think you've probably signed up to the uh, Little Green Cheese um, mailing list. Um, and most of the things you'll get from there are your um, uh, podcast episode notifications. You'll get a copy of the podcast text. Um, and uh, basically, you've got to click on the link and you'll get the download. Now, don't forget to also pop over to cheeseman.tv, that's the URL, um, and you can subscribe to the YouTube channel and uh, you'll get notified of all of the um, cheesy video content that I produce um, and that should go to, um, you'll get an email about that as well. Uh, it'll be in your YouTube preferences on how you get different notifications. But fantastic, thank you. Well, you, you're actually one... One, one step ahead of most people um, who ask me questions, Elaine, and that is that you've actually made a cheese successfully. So uh, that, that one step um, should help you on your um, way to uh, confidence on making uh, further cheeses down the road. Anyway, thanks very much for um, dropping by and saying g'day. All right, the next question is from Walt, and this one... This question is a doozy. But anyway, I've had to do some research and uh, I think I found a solution. Anyway, over to Walt. Hi, Gavin. 
first, thanks for all of the gifts that you give the cheese making community. I made a um, raw milk uh, goat cheese in a tome style and um, cutting it open, I have what appears to be a late stage um, blowout. Um, it's terrible, but clearly right through the middle of the cheese, um, a sort of a little Grand Canyon is opened up, yet uh, the, the paste texture is excellent. The flavor is just excellent, and yet it's a, it's a bit unsightly, and it's not what I want. I have heard that uh, <clears throat> one way to control that is by introducing a, um, I'm not quite sure technically what it is, but it's uh, called uh, lysozyme. I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing that properly, but I've read that it gets introduced into a lot of cheese, uh, commercial and otherwise, to keep late stage uh, blowout from occurring. Have you ever used it? Have you heard of it uh, being used? And as a home cheese maker, making uh, typically 10 gallons at a time in terms of milk, would you have suggestions as to how I would use it, when it would be introduced to the milk, and in what quantities? Again, appreciate all that you do for the cheese making community. Okay, thanks very much, Walt, for that doozy of a question. Now, lysozyme is uh, it's an antibacterial, antifungal that's in many, many things through it. Uh, oh, let me just see. <laughs> it's a component of many animals and uh, vegetables and that sort of thing. It's actually one of the strongest antibacterials and antibiotics um, that are found in the uh, the human body. It's also found in tears, saliva. Uh, it's also present in our spleen, lungs, kidneys, white blood cells, plasma, and breast milk. Uh, not only does it have an antibacterial uh, activity, um, it is also um, used to prevent a thing called um, um, butric acid blight blowing, which is what Walt is referring to. Uh, and that is due to a bacterium called uh, Clostridium, spelled C-L-O-S-T-R-I-D-I-U-M, Clostridium. Now, this um, bacteria uh, produces butyric acid, and it also produces carbon dioxide, and it produces hydrogen. And that's the reason for the crack in your massive um, the Grand Canyon style cheese. Sometimes you can see that it'll also have, um, it'll look like eyes, small eyes as well. Now it's the butyric acid that um, makes the cheese taste a bit funny. Uh, it makes the cheese unpalatable um, and uh, the blowing is caused by the gases, as I mentioned, um, by the, uh, the clostridia. It the clostid, the clostridia bacterium ferments the sugars and the lactic acids, um, and uh, therefore we need to kill it off. Even pasteurisation and all the hygiene in the world can't get rid of this bacteria or the uh, which produces spores. Now it's when the spores start that's when the gas, off gassing and the acid production happens. So to kill that off, what we need to do is there's a product, um, there's a product, and it's called Lysosac, um, and it's uh, it's the uh, lysozyme enzyme, um, and it's found in egg white protein. So the egg white protein, it comes in a powder. You can buy it as a product. The brand name is Lysolac. Um, spelt L-Y-S-O-L-A-C, Lysolac. And most good cheese-making suppliers, I say most, I don't supply it because I've never come across it, um, they do sell it, and they sell it in 50 gram and usually 500 gram sizes. Now what you actually do is make a 10% solution of the uh, Lysolac. So you take a litre or a quart of water, and you add 100 grams um, of lysolac, and then you 
add it directly to the warmed, warmed milk. And what this does is the um, uh, Clostridia bacterium, they don't start to uh, produce the gases and stuff until they have an anaerobic um, environment, so there's no air. Uh, so basically, um, then they start producing the gases and all that stuff. And what the lysolac does, it actually breaks down the cell walls of the bacterium and kills them off. Now, it's perfectly palatable. Um, it doesn't affect the texture or the uh, uh, taste um, of your cheese. In fact, it'll probably improve it, um, especially if you're finding it late blown. Now, you're probably wondering what causes um, uh, butyric acid late blown cheeses. And what it has been pinpointed down to is um, silage that has been fed to um, dairy animals. Now, usually in winter, silage is produced instead of hay. It contains more nutrients for cows, um, sheep, and, and probably um, goats, goats as well. But I know that uh, just from experience living on a dairy farm, that uh, when I was a kid, uh, my dad used to make mountains of this stuff called silage. It was just green uh, grass that uh, was then placed under black plastic and then it ferments um, and it ferments and there's lots of bacteria in it. And one of those bacteria, um, unfortunately, um, is the one that causes the, uh, the late blow. So um, where can you get it from, the uh, lysolac? You can get it from Amazon. I'll put an Amazon link into uh, the show notes, um, and that has a product you can ship it. Through. It gets shipped throughout the US. I think it, they do ship overseas as well. Um, some uh, cheesemakers do have it as well. It's fairly cheap. Uh, for fifty grams, it's about seven dollars fifty. So it's not that's uh, US. So it's not too bad at all. Um, so hopefully, um, and it's probably the milk you're using and you don't know whether what the animals are being fed, if they're being fed silage, then that's the cause for the, uh, uh, the Clostridia, um, uh, late blowing. So, um, unfortunately, I'm oh, sorry, fortunately, we don't see much of it here in Australia because, um, where I live anyway, and the milk I get supplied they're all fed on uh, grass. There's green grass all the time. Now, green grass doesn't um, have that bacteria present in it. It's only present when it's made into silage and fermented. So, um, yeah, maybe try another brand of milk as well if you can't get your hands on uh, Lysolac. Anyway, hopefully that answers your question, Walt. And uh, it certainly was a doo doozy, and I had to <laughs> go and do some research to uh, find the answer. Um, I have actually had late blown cheeses myself. One was a, a, a Parmesan and it was a doozy. All that was left was a shell of the cheese. The rind of the cheese in the centre was hollow. Um, crazy. And I didn't know at the time what it was all about. Um, and uh, yeah, so now we all know. Anyway, thanks for the question. Um, next question is from Adam. Hi, Gavin. This is Adam from California. I recently opened a cheddar that I made back in January. After letting it uh, age in a ripening box, it started to develop uh, some cracks. So on your recommendation, I went ahead and vac packed it. Well, the cracks sealed up nicely under, under vac packing, and I let it mature for about six months in, uh, in the vacuum bag. At the end of uh, the six months, I went ahead and cracked it open. I split it in half and had a taste. And I was surprised that it had a very mild uh, flavor, almost like an Alpine-style cheese. And I backpacked uh, half of it and put it back in my cheese cave. And the rest of it, I put it in a maturing box. And I noticed that over time, it started developing a more cheddary flavor. Have you finished cheeses uh, in ripening boxes after vac packing them before? And do you recommend that to get different f flavor profiles? Uh, well, thanks for your question, Adam. Um, the answer is yes, I have done that. Um, some cheeses that come to mind 
that I initially vac packed was um, Havati. Um, I vac packed it first, and then uh, then after about three weeks, then I let it because uh, it was starting to flatten in the vac pack because it's a really soft cheese. And I pulled it out and put it in a ripening box and started to firm up, started to get a bit of a rind, and uh, the flavour was amazing. Now, I didn't taste it when I took it out of the vacuum packing, so um, I'm not sure. Now, uh, technically, uh, the art of vacuum packing has only recently um, been used by cheesemakers, commercial cheesemakers anyway. Um, and really the cheese doesn't need oxygen to develop the enzymes, um, that are produced that break down the fats and proteins within the cheese and give us the lovely flavors. Um, however, it seems on the occasion that you noticed that, uh, by taking it out of the vacuum packing and exposing it to oxygen, um, and putting in a ripening box, it actually started to uh, improve the flavour or deepen the flavour. Um, so, very interesting observation. I can't say I've actually observed that myself, um, and there really shouldn't be any reason why the um, cheese would slow down enzyme development um, just because it's vacuum packed. Um, I've had cheeses aged. Um, from as little as uh, three months, and they absolutely taste fantastic, um, and kind of as I expect anyway. Um, so, yeah, very unusual, but uh, you, you've stumbled across something. I might have to experiment further and uh, and see what happens um, by uh, vacuum packing in them to avoid mold, mold growth in the early stages of the cheese, and then maybe um, taking out of the vacuum packing a month before it needs to be and uh, mature it naturally there and uh, see what the difference is and maybe have a test um, subject. Um, have one, uh, make two cheeses at the same time, exactly the same, have one vacuum packed all the way and then one take it out a month before. So that'll be very interesting too. Um, but anyway, thanks for your question, Adam, um, and uh, hope that helps, if anything. Anyway... Uh, we have one last question, and this one is from Randy. Now, Randy, I can't find a podcast episode that it was in, but I'm sure Randy interviewed me many moons ago about cheese making and stuff. He gave me a whole list of questions and stuff, and I think I used it for a podcast episode. But I went back and looked through my archive, and I cannot find where we where I posted the the information. So if anybody can remind me what episode number Randy was talking in. Um, anyway, let's get on with Randy's question. It's a good one. And uh, I've got a few solutions for him. Anyway, here he is. Hi, Gavin. Uh, some years ago, uh, you allowed me to give you an interview, uh, which I used for some studies at the time. And uh, I wanted to thank you again for that. And I had an honest question for you. Um, Lord willing, I'm hoping to get married in the next year, and for our reception for the groom's cake, we're wanting to basically have a stack of a couple wheels of cheese, um, which is going to be great. But I would like to make at least one of the wheels, and I'm thinking one of the wheels is going to be a five kilogram cheddar. That's a lot of milk. Um, I think that's what approximately 50 liters of milk. And my question to you is for large batches of cheese for the overzealous, if you have any recommendations as far as possibilities, um, if one could, uh, I guess, make multiple batches of milk at a time and let the other cheddars basically go through the cheddaring process a little longer while you're uh, basically making the curds for the other batches. Um, just trying to find a way of doing this that wouldn't involve my bathtub and breaking some. Um, uh, just a lot of rules. Um, thank you again for everything you're doing. I love the channel. love what you're doing. Um, this is uh, Randy, by the way. Thanks again, sir. Thank you, Randy. Appreciate it. <laughs> I love your question too. Um, and um, thanks for catching back up again. It's great. 
Um, I do have a few solutions for you. Now, um, what you could do is obviously buy a big pot, but that, that may be troublesome to get that. Um, and you could then heat the milk on a gas ring, a, a one they use for um, when you go camping, um, and that might work. So 50 litres is... So what's uh, 15 litres is three gallons, so that's six, nine, nine and a half, no, nine and a half, nine and a half gallons. Whew, that's a lot of milk. Um, so, no, nine, yeah, nine, ten, it'll be ten and a half, ten and a half gallons, oh, whatever. Anyway, um, it's uh, 15 litres per three gallons, if that makes sense. So... Um, what you could do is buy a big pot, obviously. Um, and I'm sure that there would be some online somewhere and you could heat the milk up using, like I said, a camping gas ring, a big gas burner and uh, pop the pot on top and, and Bob's your uncle. You'd be able to do it all in one batch and you would be able to press the cheese in a colander. Now, I've seen colanders. In fact, I've got one myself. It's stainless steel. It actually fits inside another pot, so it's like you can um, you can cook pasta in it. So it's two. So the, the main pot stainless steel. The insert, which uh, looks like a colander, it's got holes and stuff. You can cook pasta in that bit, pull it out, and then the pasta's all drained. Um, I've actually got a eight liter or two gallon pot um, one insert like that. And that actually probably would make a five kilogram block of cheese. So if you can find yourself something like that and use that as the mould, um, you'd have to make a follower out of, um, uh, what is it, high density polyethylene, which is um, most of those white um, chopping boards, for food chopping boards, uh, um, high density polyethylene, it's a white plastic. So you could cut, cut that out to be the same size as the colander, the pot colander, and that can be your pressing plate. Now, to get enough weight to press the cheese, that's going to be the hardest part. So you're going to have to devise some method to, um, to basically uh, apply 50 pounds per square inch um, on top of that pressing plate. So it's going to be a lot of weight. So I'll leave that to your imagination. There are, I, I do have a cheese making video where I show homemade cheese presses, but I don't think they're to that scale. Um, so a lot of um, uh, commercial, uh, commercial operations actually use pneumatics to press the cheese. So they have a hydraulic press. Um, and uh, basically squeeze the heck out of the cheese. So so there's a few suggestions. Now, so that's on the grand scale, okay? If you can't find a big pot, what you can do is get, um, I would get three three-gallon pots and then just make three batches of cheddar. And then when it comes down to the end to do the cheddaring part, you're just going to have to find something to cheddar it in. The, the remaining curds um, so you can cut the slabs and let them drain and all that sort of stuff um, and then combine those all those curds from those three batches together into a similar sort of um, stainless steel colander that I was talking about you know it's got straight sides flat bottom um, and uh, yeah like I said you can cook pasta in it and pull it straight out and Bob's your uncle it's all drained um, so there's some suggestions. Um, hopefully that'll get the creative juices flowing. And by the way, congratulations um, on your engagement and um, um, and your upcoming um, uh, marriage. Um, well done, mate. Um, obviously, college went well for you. Um, hope that answers your question, Randy. And um, I really do appreciate you coming back again and and calling in and uh, telling me uh, what's going down. All righty. Mm -hmm. 
Now, I have just run out of uh, voicemails. Randy was the last one that came in today um, of all times. And uh, so I'm after some more. Don't hold back. Um, if you want to leave a voicemail for me, pop over to littlegreencheese.com and uh, there'll be on the right-hand sidebar, there's a, a little widget. Click on that and you can record a, a voicemail, message, question, a shout out, say hello, what have you, um, and I will play it on the show. Um, when I don't have uh, any voicemails, I resort back to emails and you'll have to hear my voice drone on for the entire show. And I'm sure you'd rather hear somebody, some questions being answered. So jump on. Um, I'm sure there's lots of newbie cheesemakers out there that have a burning question that they'd like answered, even if it's been played before. My goodness, we've been doing 80 shows. I can't even remember what half the shows were about. So um, I don't expect anybody else to. Um, so like I said, pop over to littlegreencheese.com and uh, leave a voicemail using the right-hand sidebar or any of the, uh, there's a little widget in every show notes um, where you can just press record and uh, record a message and I'll gladly play them on the show. Um, whatever you do, don't put any personal information as in your email address or what have you into the um, uh, into the message because I can see that afterwards. You have to put that to uh, post the, the message to me, so don't leave that, but leave your name. That would be lovely. <laughs> Sometimes I have to guess. Anyway, um, well, thanks for all. Uh, thanks to you. <laughs> Thank you for uh, popping by and uh, having a listen or watch the show as it's now um, streamed on live on uh, YouTube as well. Not live, uh, pre-recorded. Um, but uh, yeah, I really do appreciate you lending my, me your ears um, for the duration of about thirty minutes every week. Um, it's been enjoyable to bring you the show and uh, we're up to 80 now so only 20 till we reach 100 that's amazing can't believe I've been doing this for so long <sighs> goodness me okay now one last thing that I want to mention is that if you're not already subscribed to my YouTube channel I'm up to about ooh, 100 and 108,000 subscribers um, if you subscribe to that channel, you'll get notified when the videos, each video comes out. I'm doing about two, three, no, three a week now. Goodness me. So three videos about cheese stuff every week. Usually it's a taste test or an update about a cheese. And uh, most weeks we have a new cheese recipe. Um, but I'm trying to find time to record those because they, they take time like... Uh, over two weeks um, of recording just to do one 30-minute uh, cheese-making video tutorial. So there's a lot of time and effort that goes into making those tutorials. So don't miss them um, because you're not subscribed. So pop over to cheeseman.tv, that's the URL, and uh, you'll be whisked away to my YouTube channel and you can subscribe to the channel there. Uh, while you're at it, don't forget to sign up to the newsletter for littlegreencheese.com. Um, if you pop over to that website, there's a little pop-up box that comes up and uh, you can sign up and then you'll get notified of all the podcasts and any other blog posts that I post um, once a week on Fridays. I send a newsletter out um, so uh, you'll get that information uh, if you've signed up, which is fantastic. Okay. Um, that's about all time. All we've got time for this week. Uh, don't forget that if you're in the market for any um, cheesy uh, kits, uh, supplies or equipment, then you couldn't do any worse than popping over to littlegreenworkshops.com.au, which is a lovely little online store run by myself and my lovely wife, Kim. Um, so we do ship all over the world except for probably about five countries that don't let us ship that sort of stuff into their uh, into their country. So uh, we've had to uh, block them. So, uh, yeah, we ship everywhere. Um, and and uh, any orders over $125 within Australia, we ship to 
most states and most capital cities um, free of charge. So um, check that out. Um, okay. You've been listening to Little Green Cheese Podcast. You can pick up my ebook, Keep Calm and Make Cheese, A Beginner's Guide to Cheese Making at Home, over at littlegreenworkshops.com.au and also at all good ebook retailers like Amazon and Apple iBook Store. You can pick up cheese making equipment, supplies, and uh, kits over at littlegreenworkshops.com.au. You can also see all of my video tutorials. There are over 250 of them now over at cheeseman.tv. Thanks for listening and watching, and I'll see you next time on Little Green Cheese Podcast. During the show, you've been listening to music by Kevin McLeod. I played Malt Shop Bop, Call to the Dairy Cows, and the news theme. Well, thanks for all you YouTubers out there that have been watching the show. I do appreciate it. There are about 500 of you that watch the shows every week, which is fantastic. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to sit through an, uh, an audio slant uh, video sort of podcast episode. Um, because I don't have a producer um, helping me out to do these shows, Kim helps me produce the live show, of course. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, uh, it's fairly static, and you're looking at a picture of me talk, a picture of me talking, basically, like this. Um, but uh, anyway, like I said, um, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.